Hey guys, Gaia Gaius back at it again with more Gaia gear. We're back. Part 6, guys. Let's dive right into this. It's been a long time coming. And now we're finally entering the third arc of Gaia gear. The war against the Manhunters is finally about to commence. And with it, we get one of the fastest as well as the largest in scale arcs in the entire story. However, due to the complexity of the second half of the story, I am once again going to be cutting back on the amount of episodes upon which I cover, because each episode of the second half has so much happen in it. It's insane. We're going to be doing the remainder of the Geiger series one episode at a time. It's really the only way, because this second half is so much more intense than the first. We're going to be diving in headfirst into a massive explosion of epic proportions. The two episodes ahead are a real treat, as the entire length of episode 14 is almost completely dedicated to the first major battle we'll see between the forces of Metatron and the forces of the Manhunters. This battle is huge. I'm not kidding. I'm talking Amuro leading an army of Jagans to stop Axis Huge, and you get to hear me geek out about this fight in its entire length once we get to it. Now, without further ado... Let's get into the story once again with episode 13. All images and characters are owned by the respective companies and creators. With episode 13, where we last left off Afaranchi and his friends, they had managed to just escape the Hellas colony, with Afaranchi having an important encounter with his newfound arch enemy, B. John Dargle, the head of the Manhunter Agency, who seeks to return humanity from its place amongst the colonies and bring them back to Earth to start anew. With this rising threat to Earth emerging and Afaranchi's escape, he now returns to Metatron to help lead the charge against this dangerous new enemy. And what an escape that was! Afaranchi and his Metatron allies made use of an amazing inclusion to Gaia Gear's world building, with Afaranchi temporarily piloting the mighty Zoran Soul, a 90-year-old mobile suit now turned Metatron Man Machine whose own technological ancestry is that of the Great Sazabi, the very suit Shar Aznable used in his final battle against the Federation upon his death, with Avaranchi unlocking his true powers as a new type and coming to a full understanding of his newfound role as both Metatron's leader and the heir to Shar. With this new power, Afaranchi managed to activate the hidden weapons buried within the 90-year-old mobile suit, releasing the suit's old sword funnels to defeat an entire squadron of seven man machines single-handedly. With him and his friends escaping the colony of Hellas, they head back to Metatron, with Afaranchi gaining newfound purpose in his own journey as the new leader of this organization. With that recap done, we're going to dive into episode 13 now. So thank you for watching, and let's go. We pick up our story in space. Three weeks have passed since our heroes returned to the fleet. Joe and Kellen are returning from a training exercise along with Messer and Ray, and the group requests docking with the Mother Metatron. Kellen asks Joe how he feels having to babysit the newcomers, which sparks an angry reaction from the two as they hate being called children when they're trying their hardest to adjust to their new roles as pilots for Metatron. Kellen laughs at the joke he made, and Joe tells them that they won't be treated like that anymore once they improve. Their skills with the Metatron's man machines are lacking, and the two were hit several times during the training exercise. Messer says it's nothing more than training, and Ray finds it annoying that their training mostly consists of just playing tag with another pilot. Joe berates them, telling them that they can't underestimate the enemy's man machines, that if they can't handle the training, then how could they possibly be capable of surviving a battle? Later in the hangar, the man machines are being serviced. Madra asks Krishna how the two new recruits are doing with Joe as their teacher. Krishna says they're doing well and that they're fast learners, but unfortunately their attitude towards combat needs a good adjustment. Madra chuckles, as he knows that the two can't seem to ditch their delinquent-like ways, and says that they still possess a lot of promise in their level of skill. Krishna asks Madra when it'll be her turn to pilot a man machine, and the question leaves Madra with a little smirk, as he never knew that she was a pilot cadet when she joined. As the sound of tools buzz throughout the hangar, Krishna asks the captain about the strange recent development that has occurred over the course of the past few weeks, that the Manhunter forces, of all things, have sent a small scouting detachment down to the Earth. Madra confirms this and says that the intel they learned hints that something big is about to go down, with only a small group of their forces being sent down to Europe. 
but now a huge number of Federation and Manhunter Space Forces have strangely gathered at Hellas, and a massive fleet is assembling at this very moment. Krishna asks why this is happening so soon, as the Earth Reverse Immigration Plan hasn't even been announced to the public yet, and the captain says that the fact it hasn't been announced is the very reason why they can't become complacent right now. Something big is about to happen, and the forces of Metatron have to be ready to face whatever it is. When Krishna asks what Metatron's plans are, the captain laments that they're for the top brass to decide, and that they simply need to be prepared to fight at any moment. The captain tells her to be prepared, and Krishna says she'll be fine, as she knows they have Aparachi to lead them. In the war room, Glenn Coldill hands Aparachi the transcript for a laser-transmitted message that they managed to receive from Hellas. It seems the Manhunters are now on the move. The fleet from Side 2 has left and has now entered geosynchronous orbit with the Earth. Their entire force is planning to make Earth fall soon. When Afarachi asks if their whole force is planning to go there, Admiral Parrish sneers, as he sees from the intel that the Manhunter capital ship and B. John's personal flagship, the Geijisu, has been confirmed to be amongst the ships in the fleet, which means that Dargle is amongst the forces that plan to make it to Earth. When Admiral Parrish says that this is their chance, that with the majority of the Manhunters absent, this is their best chance to reorganize their troops, Avarachi demands to know why they should be ignoring the Manhunter forces that plan to be heading to the Earth. The Admiral says that they don't have any other choice, as they still need to discern what exactly the Manhunters' plans of action are, and that they can't afford any rash decisions. Afarachi, on the other hand, asks the Admiral to consider the significance of Dargle heading to Earth. The Admiral asks what he means, and Afarachi says that this is their chance for Metatron to make a move, that even Dargle should be aware of what could happen if he leaves space undefended. And yet somehow, he's still making a move towards the Earth. He asks the Admiral what the meaning of this would be, and the Admiral denies that it doesn't hold any significance that the Manhunters don't care about what strength Metatron poses, and that in all likelihood, Dargle is using this as a display of strength to appeal to the Federation government so that he can initiate his reverse immigration plan. Afarachi then asks Glenn if the Mother Metatron will be capable of pursuing the fleet. He says yes, that at their present speed they could reach the fleet in just shy of six hours with that information. Afarachi then says the idea that's now beginning to form in his head. He then asks then if it would be possible for the forces of Metatron to catch them as they entered the atmosphere. Admiral Parrish and the other commanders when they hear this are in total disbelief. They can't believe what they're hearing. They can't believe that Afarachi is suddenly considering an actual attack on the Manhunter forces. Afarachi then asks the Admiral a question that does this War Council consider the opinion of the majority to be the opinion of everyone? The Admiral says yes, but he does bear the final word, leaving Avarachi to ask if he does defer to his judgment with this decision. The Admiral shakingly says yes, and Avarachi makes his first declaration as the new leader of Metatron, that the Mother Metatron, its fleet, and their man-machine forces will launch an attack on the Manhunter fleet before they enter Earth's atmosphere. The Admiral, however, is angered. He can't believe that this is happening. He can't believe that Afarachi is doing this. If they attack the Manhunter forces, they'd be practically declaring war against the Earth Federation by doing so. Afarachi then says that he is fully aware of that, and that this is the best time as ever for Metatron to be the ones to light the fires of resistance throughout the Earth's sphere. If they attack the Manhunter fleet right here and now, they'll deal a devastating blow to the entire Federation government and its entire military that holds full control over the colonies, as the Manhunters now serve as the majority of the Federation's fighting strength in space now. With the Admiral still angered with Afarachi's decision, Afarachi says that yes, they are short on time, but that he knows they can make this plan work, that he himself will even go out in the Gaia gear to lead the charge. Once again, the Admiral is baffled. He can't let the heir to Shar Aznable do this. And Afarachi says that he can't just hide and tell his men to go off and march to their deaths while not taking part in this operation as one of the pilots fighting on the front lines. He's going to fight, and that's final. 
later, the Admiral is left to stew in his own thoughts of what just happened in the war room. That if Avarachi had just waited a few more months, they would have been back to the strength that they had before the Manhunter's invasion of Hellas. He then asks what Glenn thinks of this, and the man says he doesn't know what to make of it. That he agrees with him, and says that he is unsure about the idea of having Afarachi lead the charge with his man machine. The captain laments that he wishes that Afarachi understood more what it means to be the leader of Metatron, what kind of decisions that entails. The moves he's making feel way too reckless for him, and the Admiral believes that they can just win if they buy their time. But for those of us who are listening, knowing that Afarachi has now met B. John Dargle, we now know how serious of a threat his reverse immigration plan would pose to the entire Earth sphere. That if he succeeds, it'll be the end of everything. The colonies, the Earth, and especially the end of all new types. He must be stopped for the good of all mankind, and for the continued preservation of all life. What Azaria himself is thinking is absolute nonsense, and speaks to his own ignorance and his simple-minded desires for glory and status. He wants to be the big general who leads the charge, but now there's this new kid who's speaking the real truth and comes from a simple way of life doesn't want him to be the one who leads the charge with such passion and integrity, as that's what he wants to be. Down in the hangar, Ray complains about their current situation and asks Messer what he thinks about the constant training exercises. Throughout all of this, Messer can't help but tell her to shut up, as because they do this, they get a free lunch and training to be a man-machine pilot, something they'd never be able to do when they spent their whole lives working with some shady gang. She has no right to complain after they willingly decided to do this. But after he says this, Ray asks him what is going on. He's telling her to go back to work. It's not like him. Suddenly, we get to know the reason why. It seems Messer is hatching a new plan. He thinks if they steal one of these Dochati man machines, they can sell it to the Manhunters along with some intel for a high price. He tells her to be quiet and just play along with the Metatron guys so that they can use the training to escape with it. He asks what Ray feels, and she says it sounds like a good plan, and Messer relays his feelings about being with Metatron that their war doesn't really have anything to do with them, that they can use the money from the Dochati to get their old gang set up in a much more luxurious place. But before they say anything more, Admiral Parrish's voice can be heard over the ship's intercom. He reveals to all of them the plan to assault the Manhunter fleet in high orbit, that they need all their man machines and troops ready for the attack in six hours. This will be their declaration of war. With his voice cutting out, the entire hangar's peaceful atmosphere changes instantly. There's a flood of gasps from everyone in the room, and with them, the sudden bustling of soldiers, mechanics, and pilots readying the man machines. This leaves the pair in shock. They never actually expected that Metatron would be declaring a war. With the two freaking out, Captain Madra finds the two and gives them their unit assignment. They're going to be fighting along with Joe in the 3rd Dochati Squadron. When Ray freaks out, saying what the two are in shock of, Madra berates them and tells them that they need to stop acting so childishly and that this is what they've been training all these past few weeks for. Messer himself is pissed off. He's baffled that he's now being asked to fight. He storms off with the two. He's going to have a word with Afaranchi. Over inside the Gaia Gear Alpha, Afaranchi and Krishna are testing out the upgrades made to the machine. He says that they're good and they work much faster than the previous ones. Krishna herself and all of the other pilots are so grateful and amazed that they all know never thought in their lives that they would be fighting alongside the famous Red Comet against the Federation. Afarachi chuckles, but relays his concerns about Parrish. The guy didn't exactly like the idea of attacking the Manhunters directly, and how Parrish told him to consider his position. Krishna then tells him that what Afarachi is doing is exactly what Shar Asnable would have done. He was always there to lead the charge into battle, that even after he reformed Neo Zeon, he never stopped being a pilot. Avaranchi is impressed by it, and it seems he's shaping up to be just like the one they all want him to be. It is here that Avaranchi asks Krishna about a monitor he's having trouble getting any sort of reading from. Krishna says that that's the display for the Man Machine Psychomo unit. Avaranchi is quick to ask what that is, and Krishna tells him that the Gaia Gear is a unique machine, both inside and out. The Saikamu is a device that feeds the pilot's brainwaves back into the suit, that is supposed to allow for the machine to be controlled entirely by the pilot's thoughts. 
Afaraji then says that once he started piloting the Gaia gear, he could actually feel his consciousness begin to expand. He asks if this is what the Saikamu does, and Krishna says actually that is correct, but only a new type will be able to feel that change in their state of mind when it occurs. Average pilots often get sick and get headaches from such a device, that normal people often have their minds horrifically damaged from the use of it. She then says that the normal man machines they have, like the Dochatis, don't have them installed, as they pose such a health hazard and that the only man machine in their arsenal that has one properly equipped is the Gaia gear. Also, the, uh, the Zoran Soul also has one, but it's a mobile suit and not a man machine, so I guess that doesn't count. That this very machine was built solely for the purpose of Avarachi. This is his machine, and the developers of it took great care when constructing this one. It is here that Messer cuts in. He floats up in the hangar bay and demands to know what Afarachi is thinking. Krishna tells him to be more respectful to his excellency, but Afarachi says it's fine and asks what's wrong. Messer asks what on earth he's doing. With them now preparing their forces for war, he can't help but feel angered by what he's doing. Krishna tells him to back off, that he needs to stop talking to him like that, but Afarachi says he's okay, that if Messer has concerns, it'd be best for him to wait when the other pilots join the briefing room to coordinate their plan of attack. Messer grunts and says he'll be waiting. We cut to a short while later, after the meeting had ended, and Afarachi understands that he's fine with the idea of Messer and Ray not being pilots. However, that because they came under the premise of joining, that they've received reasonable compensation for doing so, and that if Messer violates his orders, he will be sent to the brig. He asks if Messer understands, but the man can't help but feel threatened. Krishna steps in and says that Afarachi is following the rules and regulations of this organization, but Ray can't help but point out that his quote-unquote regulations are just dumb rules that they hate following. Afaraji asks if they themselves follow any rules, that it's only natural for humans to create them when founding basic relationships, but that in all reality it doesn't work if the two of them can't follow the rules of others at all. Messer gets pissed off again, and he tries to shove him, asking how he sees himself as so much better than him. But Afaraji steadies himself in the weightless gravity, asking Messer if he can really solve things with the amount of pent-up anger and the level of violence he always displays. Ray is quick to snark back, saying, coming from the guy who's going to war, Messer then asks if Afaraji has let the idea of being a new type get to his head. But Afaraji says that it isn't like that, that he's trying to find the best way to change himself through the use of this organization, for the good of all Earth and for the rest of humankind. Messer tries to make a snarky remark, but Afaraji cuts him off, saying that the Manhunters are misguidedly trying to save the planet through human effort. But what they're going to do with bringing all of humanity back to Earth they're inadvertently reversing all of the things done to save it in the end. That they must stop the Manhunters before this happens. They have to stop the Earth Reverse Immigration Plan now. In order to achieve that, they must unfortunately take weaponized action to prevent their plans from seeing light. Ray then points out the fact that Afaraji himself is from Earth, and that what he's saying sounds like a contradiction. That if Metatron gets their way, he won't be able to live on his little island home anymore. But Afaraji says that he understands that, and that he's willingly able to give up his little island home for the sake of Earth's overall protection, and by doing so, he will work to make the colonies a paradise for the rest of mankind. He asks if they themselves are going to help him, with the warning sirens beginning to sound. And Messer surprisingly agrees. He says that if the colonies were remade into a paradise for all of them, that'd be the best thing ever. And Afaraji asks Ray what she thinks and Ray asks what he plans on doing for the colonies. Afarachi says that there is so much they need to do. There are so many people, and they need people who can do any number of things to make it better. Ray tries to complain, and Afarachi says that they're short on time. The attack is about to begin soon, and he needs to know if he can trust the two of them right now. That they unfortunately need to finish their talk when they return. They're running out of time. He asks the two to wait in his study, leaving with Krishna. The girl saying that she'd really hoped that Messer would change his behavior. The young man lashing out as the two of them leave them to contemplate their decisions. With Messer left to think about this, the idea of a space noid paradise, the scene comes to an end. We are then brought to the Manhunter's capital ship, that being the Geijisu. We're shown that Dargle is on the bridge, and the ship's captain, by the name of Harry Suzumu, tells Dargle that they will be beginning their Earthfall very soon. Dargle says well done, and the two are soon met by Marissa, the woman asking Dargle why there hasn't been any sightings of the Metatron lately. She'd expected them to be monitoring their fleet's movements, and Harry laughs as he thinks Marissa is overreacting, that Metatron know not to mess with them, and everything is going to be fine in the end. 
The captain then says that carelessness will get you hurt, and the captain backs down. He understands that they'll continue to keep their eyes peeled for any Metatron forces that try to hinder their descent. Their man machines are on standby, and that all their troops are ready for anything. The captain says that's good, and he turns to Marissa and says that he doesn't think that Metatron is just going to sit idly by either. That he intentionally leaked the intel to Metatron in hopes of getting some kind of reaction out of them, hoping to get some kind of reaction out of Operanchi, to see how he would react. Marissa asks what's going on inside Dargle's mind, and the captain says that if he were thinking like Operanchi right now, he'd be doing everything to stop their descent. If the Manhunters managed to take control of the Earth, they wouldn't be able to stop them, and if he launches a reckless attack, the Federation government would hasten its own collapse, something that Metatron would paradoxically need to survive for its own goals. That Afarachi's goal, therefore, should be trying to attack them, before the Manhunters can initiate their plans. Marissa wonders if Afarachi is that far ahead. The captain says that they'll find that out sooner or later. And with that being said, the alarm sirens begin to sound. The Mother Metatron has made her arrival. She's currently following them from the portside rear along with a small flotilla. The captain of the ship then orders the Geijisu to first level battle stations. The man machines will launch to intercept their forces coming from behind. Afaranchi is here. Shar's heir has come to face them. Mother Metatron, Hangar Bay. The alarm klaxons sound throughout the ship. All man machines begin to make their launch procedures. The Mother Metatron support carriers are also ready as well. The ostentatiously named Garda-esque transport ships, the Air Forces 1, 2, and 3. Before Afaranchi enters his machine, Madra and Krishna tell him that they'll be heading over to the Air Force 1, where they will be waiting to pick them up when the Earth's gravity begins to pull them in. Afaranchi himself is ready, but says that if things get too dicey, he can still transform the Gaia gear into its fighter mode and make it through the atmosphere. The two are surprised to be soon met by Messer as well as Ray. Afaranchi asks if the two of them had a change of heart. The two say that they have. They're not going to sit back and watch as everyone else goes off to fight. They're in this too. The two head off to their dochatis and Afaranchi boards the elevator with the Gaia gear. Now finally completed with a new pristine silverish white paint job to complement it. The Gaia gear walks towards the elevator, rising up as the first two squadrons have already departed. As it does, we see that Joe is glad to see that the two rookies have finally changed their minds, and Messer tells him to knock it off. He just wants to get himself out there into the action. Joe directs them to Dochati number 6 and number 7 as those are their machines for this mission, with him taking the lead with his own custom unit, the Dochati DH-3B. They have to be fast now though, as they are late for their launches. As the three make their way to the catapult, Joe explains to them that they need to keep a tight formation. Their target is only Dargle's capital ship, the Geijisu, and if they can't make it and they begin to burn atmosphere, they need to retreat to their carrier, the Air Force One. Messer wonders if they can even pull off such a maneuver, but Joe tells tells them that they need to be ready for that or else they'll burn up. Messer cheers on their unit, and Ray herself remains quiet. She's still shocked that she's here. She never thought she'd be in a man machine one day fighting for Metatron. Shortly after, with a contact link from Messer's Dochati's hand, Messer asks if she's still in on their little scheme to steal these suits. She asks if Messer has been lying this whole time, and Messer says that he was, and that he has no reasons to go and die for Afaranchi's cause. But, Ray starts to get it as to why Afaranchi and him don't get along so much. Messer asks if she said anything, but Ray says no. She's still gonna follow their plan to steal them. Back in the elevator, Afaranchi begins his preparations to launch. The Gaia Gear Alpha has been equipped with a Hyper Mega Launcher. The unit is in its fighter mode with the launcher slung to its underside. Afaranchi boards the machine and closes the cockpit hatch. As he begins the launch sequence, he can start to sense the emotions resonating through space. He grips the controls tightly. He can feel the malice burning from the void beyond. It feels like a growing storm of hatred, and he can sense it, the center of that storm. It's him, B. John Dargle. The Geiger Alpha locks its landing gears onto the catapult. The afterburners begin to fire up. Afaranchi gives the signal. Afaranchi Shar, Geiger Alpha, launching. With sparks ripping across the catapult, the Geiger Alpha blasts off into the darkness. The battle has begun, with distant beam fire sparking across the stars. Now, episode 13, the battle has started, but we are going to have to wait for the next video where I'm going to get to covering it, as the battle is going to take a lot of editing on my end to show it. So for now, we'll just leave this episode as it is. We can see that already the cracks are starting to form within Metatron, 
Admiral Parrish's conversation with Glenn Coldill shows it. It sucks. These guys already don't like how Operanchi is showing them up, and it's gonna bite our heroes in the butt once those cracks give way. The Zoran soul, however, has been refined, and you get to see that really nice new armor job that has been given. The Geiger Alpha has also been finally completed, and it's gonna be awesome to see this battle unfold. Anyways, that'll be it for this time. Tune in next time where I go into episode 14, where we get to see this entire battle play out. This is Gaia Gaius, signing off. Bye!